Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath, for the peace and rest that we can experience in Christ. And we are thankful, Lord, uh, for the fellowship that we have through thy Holy Spirit. And we are thankful for the words of Scripture that give us light and understanding and comfort. We pray for Mark and his family, his relatives. We know, Lord, that in this world of sin and suffering, there are so many snares that Satan has placed in our feet. And we ask, Lord, that you can deliver us from the snare of the fowler. We invite your presence into this study. And we pray that you can direct and guide us as we open your word together. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I forgot to say, uh, I, I forgot to say this. I got this cold germs be spread well in logic Walmart. Oh, okay. Or maybe down in the weather. Okay. I'm not, I'm not feel well. Okay, thanks. And for me, is the prayer for get better. And our, our church and also band is missing me. I know I'm going to our church of this cold. Okay. I, I can't ever sleep and do my own job way of this cold. Okay. Okay, I'll keep you in our prayers, Mark. I mean, near, near the end, we, um, that's two weeks apart. Um, I find it's hard if we have a, even a week apart to sort of keep the continuity of thought. So I always do a little bit of a review now, in the book of Hebrews, um, in the first part, we know that Paul is showing that Christ is qualified to be our high priest. And this latter part of the book of Hebrews, Paul really addresses uh, the new covenant, how much greater it is than the old covenant. And that's based upon Christ. And the old covenant has these limitations in that the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. And in Hebrews chapter 10, we looked at that um, in a little bit more detail. That under Moses' law, um, that you died at the mouth of two or three, three witnesses. But it's much greater to reject the everlasting covenant, the new covenant. Because it's, it's dealing with eternal life, not just your temporal life. Then Hebrews chapter 11, of course, of course, we know is the faith chapter. And to me, the, the point that I've always gotten from Hebrews chapter 11 is that there is a final generation, and that generation um, is necessary for all who have died in faith to be eternally secure. And Hebrews chapter 12 is a continuation of that. That's why when he says, wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, the, this cloud of witnesses are those people that he has listed in Hebrews chapter 11. And so remember, he went through, through Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and um, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Uh, but then he's he's going to go and, and Rahab the harlot and, and different people. He's going to go through this whole history and talk about all those who have suffered. Right? In verse 36, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword. 
They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So us being the final generation, we have this cloud of witnesses. So we're compassed about with the cloud of witnesses that there are those who have witnessed to the goodness of God by their life. They have demonstrated that faith and we are now have to take up that weight or that that burden when he says let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down on the right hand of the throne of god so um there's lots of different ideas or threads that we could pick up here. Now, when he talks about the cross, what is Paul talking about in the context of he, the book of Hebrews? What is the cross? I mean, that's kind of a broad question. But when it says he endured the cross, what, what is Paul talking about, the cross? Um, sorry, guys, being rude. I yeah. let you go back. You're talking. My mom wanted me to say my camera off, and I am still with you, and I am hear you. Okay. So um, when, when we talk about the cross, what is the cross in the context of the book of Hebrews? Um, we saw Iran there put separation from but God. It was, a, it was the ending of one uh, covenant and the beginning of another, or the ending of one um, okay. yeah. era. Yeah, because the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. And when we think of the cross, this, this has to do with the taking away or the removing of sin in the context of the sanctuary. But this is Christ's work um, in the heavenly sanctuary. He, he is the offering. Now, what, what about this part that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, this, this phrase or this translation here uh, comes from Win William Tyndale. It is, um, this is his wording that has come into the King James on how he translated this. Um, literally the word, it doesn't mean, I mean, it can mean author, but it means captain or prince a chief leader, that's really what the word is, um, archaegos, archaegos, however you say that in Greek, and finisher, teleotes, that's a completer. So what, what does this mean that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith? He begins it and he ends it. Okay, he begins it and he ends it. And, and that's the idea of, um, like the author, I actually like that because even though that's not really what the word means, uh, the idea there is is in agreement with, with scripture. But how does this relate to the sanctuary?
He has a great deal of work he's doing on our part to finish and prepare us for heaven. Okay. But in the context of everything that's been in Hebrews so far, because if you go back to Hebrews chapter 1, it shows that he is fully God. And Hebrews chapter 2 says that he's fully man and that he's greater, you know, greater than Moses, um, greater than Abraham, greater than Joshua. And he's our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. So when he's talking about he's the author and finisher of our faith, what is the context that that he's addressing? Without him, there would be no sanctuary. Okay, so this is relating to the sanctuary, is it not? That when we talk about the cross, the cross is the offering for sin. And that's the thing that he that's the thing that makes him the author. Because when, when we look at the book of Hebrews and we kind of just take these chapters by themselves, we sometimes miss what is being said. So the way that I look at this is Paul is writing this in a very organized fashion. And, and he's dealt with chapter 11, where he's addressed what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then he gives an example of all these people who have had faith. So this is the faith he's talking about. This is the faith that can endure trials, uh, punishments, sufferings, afflictions, all kinds of things that, that human beings could not endure if they didn't have this heavenly crown before them. So when Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, this is through the cross that he becomes both the author and the finisher of our faith. So he's, he endures the cross, but he's also set down on the right hand of the throne of God. That's the end goal to which Christ is, is looking for us, that we can be with, with, with the Father, be with him. But in order to get there, he had to endure the cross. So Paul's going to lay this out of of what this means in a very practical sense. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without ch chastisement, whereof all, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way and let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which 
no man can see the Lord. Look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be a fornicator, a profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now, there's a lot here, even though there's, there's this very continuous thought here about enduring suffering and, and how God is going to chasten those that he loves, that we can rejoice in tribulation and trials. But how does this relate to the topic in the book of Hebrews? Why is Paul presenting this? What is he saying to us? Hold fast. Okay, hold fast. And he's given that message already in the book of Hebrews. That, that the just shall live by faith, that we have, even though he tarries. But he's giving, <clears throat> he's, he is giving specific examples now. Okay. Can you go on, explain a bit more? Well, in a situation like this, here is Paul who has stated that the just shall live by faith. And that's a, a restate really of, of what we've read from the Old Testament, from a habit, right? Two, two verse four, yep. Now he's coming through here and saying, here are examples of those that portended their faith but chose not to hold to faith. They did not hold faith in that which was true. They held faith in that which was fleeting. Mm -hmm. So Paul is giving a, a, a very concrete example mm -hmm. for what we need to be able to do at this time of our history. And Christ is that example. Yes. That is, without him, none of this would be possible. That the new covenant, in entering into this new covenant, there is a cross to bear. Okay, because, but but yeah. but in the in these situations, when we are dealing with the covenant and the covenant relationship, yeah, we are dealing with a situation that God is already is already showing us the cross that He is bearing. Mm -hmm. that Christ has had to bear on our behalf mm -hmm. because everything that Christ has done, the father has had to do as well. Right. Yeah. Now the promise that was given in Eden mm -hmm. was a covenant just as much as the covenants that the children of Israel entered into and then rejected later. Mm -hmm. when we're dealing with what what there is for a quote new and old covenant mm -hmm. the new covenant is it not a realization that god will do what he says he can do and that there's nothing of our own strength that we can do to keep the covenant mm -hmm. Now, if we look at the study we did last night, not, not everybody here was at the study last night, but in the study last night, we were looking at the birthright 
of the firstborn. And when we talk here, when he talks about being sons, this is the inheritance of that promise that was first, I mean, really first given to Adam, you know, Adam and Eve about the firstborn, the seed of the woman. And, and this, this work that Christ has done is fulfilling that promise made to Adam and Eve. But that promise also applies to the sons of God, to the children of God. That we are the children of God and that what Christ has experienced, he did for us, but we also have to experience it. When he says, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. This means that there is a resisting against sin. That Christ didn't do everything for us and we just passively uh, accept his salvation and just think we're going to be saved because he died on the cross for us. That there is a work that we have to do in cooperation with God, with Christ. You know, there are people like Baptists, for instance, who think once saved, always saved. That is, they look at salvation as once you confess, and, and they misread a verse that says, you know, if you um, confess, I can't remember how it goes, but, you know, believe in your heart, confess with your lips the Lord Jesus, ye shall be saved. And they take that as once you've done that confession, you then are saved, and there's nothing you can do to get unsaved. Um, but it doesn't say you are saved. It says you shall be saved. And that's something that we continually do. That is, it's something I can't just have done once. I have to continually believe in my heart, confess with my mouth, the Lord Jesus. I have to live it in my life. And the chastening that God does, the suffering that we experience, that's correction. That is, God is trying to correct us. He's allowing us to go through trials so that we can taste of Christ's sufferings. And we taste of Christ's sufferings so that we can experience his life. You know, a good example of this is in Romans. Um, in Romans chapter 6, when Paul talks about baptism, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So that means we have to die. Now we die in Christ because if we died for our own sins, we would never come up in the resurrection. Christ has to, we have to die with Christ. He bears our sins and we come up in newness of life because Christ has come up in newness of life. He has been resurrected. And so we're dependent upon his work He's the author and finisher of our faith. None of this can be accomplished without Christ. But the thing is, it does have to be accomplished. It has to be real. Now, we've spent some time in some of our other studies, uh, Dwight's studies, and even in, in the studies on the sanctuary, looking at the covenants. And also, of course, in Hebrews. What is a covenant?
it is an agreement generally between parties. So generally, you have two parties. They make a covenant with each other. Now, when we look at the everlasting covenant, the promise that's made to Adam and Eve in the garden, is God asking anything of Adam and Eve? No. Yeah, so we, we can say no, because God just promises what he's going to do. And, and it's, on the surface at least, he's not asking Adam and Eve to make a covenant with him. He's making a covenant with them. He's giving them a promise of what he's going to do. And, and that's all initiated by God. Adam and Eve aren't asking for this covenant. Based upon the previous agreement, God says, if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, ye shall surely die. They actually should have died. In the but day in this, thereof. yeah. In, in going along with, with your statement. Yeah. Has he not laid out the blessings of here is the entire garden mm -hmm. and then laid out the curse for disobedience if they did eat of that tree? Right. So in his initial, because he makes a covenant with them at the beginning, if you want to take it as this covenant, this is the test that he gives them. He, he gives them everything but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they sin, and, they, and, and the result of that would be death. But now he gives them this other covenant, which is based upon a promised seed that is going to redeem them, that's going to conquer Satan, and, and through which they will receive eternal life. So God promises this. And so people struggle with this on the one hand because they, we look at a covenant where God is based upon God's promises. And the question is, what is God expecting of us? And so different, different people have different views on what it, what is God requiring? Now, some people just, he just, we require that he, we believe. So an example of this that, that we often hear is, you know, money was put into our bank account and all we have to do is withdraw it if we don't withdraw it then we don't receive the benefit of that money now i don't think this is is really a good example why would it not be a good example what's wrong with that example so the money in our account is eternal life so we just basically have to believe that it's there is that all that god is requiring of us no okay can you expand on that what how would we how would we take that type of an example how would we fix it every time we sin then that promise of money in that bank account would be taken away unless we confess that sin okay so that money is dependent on not just a one-time acceptance and withdrawal. Okay. Any other thoughts or ideas? I would think you would, God would want you to spend it in a way that he would spend it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there has to be a change of character because eternal life is not something that God can just give us. Because what if God gave us eternal life, but we didn't want it? What would be the result? It'd be no different than it is today, right? <laughs> no, it'd be worse. Yeah, wouldn't we be eternally miserable? Yes. If somebody didn't, did not love the company of God and of the saints, of God's people, he had no love for it. He would be eternally miserable having to endure 
our company, you know, for eternity. So God doesn't just give eternal life to everyone. Because it's not just about eternal life. You can't separate life and character. When we look at Christ, when he endures the cross, despising the shame, um, where is it here? Just, yeah. Um, I think it's back here. I don't see it. Um, what verse, verse is that? Oh, it's way back there. Okay, verse two. Um, so he endures the cross, despising the sh shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him. Now, the joy that was set before him was what? Why did he endure the cross? Because of the future ones that would listen and believe. Yeah, because of his love for us, the joy was the fellowship that he can have with us. Amen. It wasn't about, you know, being worshipped or being exalted. It was his desire for us to experience life. That's why he created Adam and Eve. And he puts before us a choice, life or death. But life or death is not just existence or non-existence. You can't have life if you do not have the character of Christ. And so the path that is put before us is the same path that was given to Jesus. If we're not changed into the same image, if we don't have the same love, if we don't have the same character, if we're not going to look at the joy that is set before us, which is not our own salvation, but the salvation of others, we, we don't have the character to endure the cross. That is, the cross cannot be endured by somebody who is selfish and self-centered and is only seeking heavenly heaven for his own joy or pleasure, that somehow he doesn't want to be lost, he wants to be saved. He that seeketh to find his life shall lose it, but he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. That's the cross. That's the character of God. That's Moses saying, blot my name out of the book. So what, what, what Paul is putting before us is something that is otherworldly. That is, this is not natural. And that's why the sentimental sort of religion, the one where we can go to church and listen to some stories and shed a few tears in sympathy with these stories, but remain unchanged in character, where we still are, are, are bitter and bickering and accusing and self-righteous. That's not true religion. True religion is a cross, and God can't do anything about it. He can't change reality. He can't save somebody against their will. But he has been our example. This is the everlasting covenant. So when we look at chapter one and chapter two, where it shows that Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully man, that he has to lower himself, lower than the angels, and take upon him a nature that has been corrupted by sin, that he might redeem it. This is the gospel. So when it says Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, this has to do with his character, 
the story that he's writing is the story of himself. And that story of Christ has to be written upon our hearts. That's what it means to have the law written and engraven upon our hearts. That means to have the character of Christ. So when we go back to the question about the covenant, the covenant that God made with Adam and Eve when they had sinned, the covenant made with Abraham, there was a requirement, and that requirement was a thing called faith. But the question is, what is faith in the context of the covenant? When we look back at Hebrews chapter 11, what was faith? You have it right before you in verse 1. Yeah. Well, it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And in the example of that, what we see is people acting contrary to their nature, trusting the invisible, and willing to endure all kinds of suffering because they see a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. They despise the world. That's faith. And faith, so faith is not merely belief because the, the devils believe and tremble. That is, they don't have a trust in God. And that our trust is in this world, in ourselves, in our own opinions, in our estimation of ourselves. And the gospel shows that all of that is foolishness. So these witnesses, what are they witnessing to when we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses? What are they witnessing to? Are they not showing that the way to God is the way of the cross? And this is yoking up with Christ. So when it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We're setting aside sin. And sin is a weight. But we're taking up another weight or burden, and that is the yoke of Christ. Now, is that burden easy or difficult? Um, can I just ask, yep. um, so great a cloud of witnesses. So are we talking um, the word of God? Are we talking um, the angels that are witnessing? No, all um, the people, all the people in in um, Hebrews chapter eleven. Oh, that's right. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So, so he's he's calling them a cloud of witnesses. That is, they're witnesses in in a sense. In this, if you wanted to put it, is like as, as a trial. They're witnesses by their life. They have witnessed to the truthfulness of the cross. By their faith, they've demonstrated the path to righteousness. Yeah, so Christ's yoke, it says, my yoke is easy and, and my burden is light. Come unto me, all that ye, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, is that a contradiction? Because of our human nature, it is. Okay. So, so we look at the cross that's before us, and human nature shuns the cross. Even Christ in his humanity shuddered at the thought of the cross. So 
So human nature cannot understand the cross. But can we joy in tribulations? Can we rejoice in suffering? We can, through Christ. Yeah, through Christ. Can we resist unto blood striving against sin? Can we have sin so hateful to us that we would rather die than sin? Through faith in Christ, we should. Yeah. Yeah, this isn't something that we can do, but we can because... God has promised it to us. And so in order to get the money from the bank account that God has put there, eternal life, it's not just mere belief. It's not just accessing the account. We have to become like Christ. I, I don't really know how to, to use that illustration in in a clear way, but it would be something where God has put in a, put that there for us. He's offered us eternal life. But what's required is that everything that he has given us, we have to be willing to give up. And we give others access to that account so they can yeah. um, see more of him. Right, because when Moses said, blot my name out of the book of life, was Moses looking for his own salvation? When Christ, when Christ was upon the cross and he felt that he couldn't, that sin was so hateful to God that he would not come in, up in the resurrection, did Christ accept that he would be eternally destroyed, that he would never have existence again? But was he still willing to endure that cross, that complete separation from God? He was. Amen. So somebody so would just, see, what's that? Mrs. White says you cannot see through the portals of the tomb. Right. The so etern, yeah, so eternal life doesn't come for people who are seeking life. Eternal life comes through death. Death to self. A change in character. Because right now we have a character that doesn't want heaven. And that character has to be changed. And it's something that we still have this nature, but it's not just about our nature. Because Christ came and conquered human nature. But he gave, we can have the mind of Christ, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputa reputation and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's what, that's what the covenant is about, what God is going to do in us, but not against our will. <clears throat> now, this next part of Hebrews chapter 12, a king, the title here in the King James, in my, the one I have here, is A Kingdom That Cannot Be Shaken. And this is going to touch on Exodus chapter 19, which we had studied and... and, and uh, Dwight has, has been studying. For ye are not come unto Mount Zion that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. So not only did that happen, remember when in second corinthians chapter three you know paul talks about how um they they didn't want to look on the glory on moses face now that's going to be the second time so but this is is the first time that that the the covenant is spoken to them so we're, we're going to look into this in a bit more detail but they don't want to hear god speak why don't they want to hear god speak
They're afraid of the voice and what he could say. Okay. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. says, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. So this is, so Dwight, can you help frame us, just remind us what this story is here that's just been mentioned? What is the significance of verse 18 to 20? And to 21, I guess. The children of Israel had been led by Moses to come out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. They had gone through the crossing at the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. They had been brought down by Rephidim. Mm -hmm. And they had come to the edge of Sinai. Mm -hmm. Now, this nation of slaves, mm -hmm. this nation that had long existed but not lived, was coming to a point where they were going to be placed directly in front of their deliverer. Mm -hmm. word was given to Moses a covenant was given to Moses to give to the children of Israel mm -hmm. now to put this in chronological perspective this is with the third month of the year that they came from Egypt mm -hmm. so we're not, uh, we're, we're not talking much more, let's say we're not talking much more than about 90 days. Because if, if we're looking at this. Yeah, it'd be more like 60 days. Well. They left on the 15th day of the first month, and this is the middle of the third month. This is the seventh day of the third month yeah so it's not even 60 days right yeah so this covenant is given to moses to present to all of the tribes and to place this further into perspective this is given prior to the ten commandments and the command is given that on the third day from the time that this covenant is presented, Moses was to go forth and sanctify the people. Now, the thing that's, if, if we're looking at this completely in chronological order, it would mean then that the covenant was given by God to Moses on the Sabbath. And for this to, to go forward on the third day would mean that on the 10th day of the third month, that the people were to then be sanctified. Okay. Okay. Just dealing with this chronology before you go on, Stephen, how do you understand this chronology because you've looked into this quite a bit. Yeah, so um, the way I understand it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You say my, my best guess would be they arrived yeah. from Mount Sinai on the 15th day of the first of the third month. Right. So you have them arriving because the self same day is the self same day that they left Egypt. Egypt. Yeah. Yes. And so. Then the, the first day, the 16th day of the third month then would be when Moses ascends the mount for the first time. I think he ascends it twice that day. And that's when he comes down from that there. Uh, then it's the three days, including that day when he uh, 
they're to sanctify themselves. And so I have the 18th day of the third month would be when God speaks his law. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, so you have a little bit different chronology because mine was more similar to Dwight's, except that um, yeah, I always had the sixth day because I had Pentecost as the day that the law was spoken. But um, Okay. So since since we do have a, a a little difference of opinion yeah i mean what what i was looking at of course was exodus 19 verses 1 and 2 yeah but then i was also looking at numbers 33 verse 15 okay yeah so numbers 33 where it gives the, the all their um yeah, so they re- departed from Raphidim and pitched in the wilderness of Sinai. And that just says their their travels. Right, because the the situation that we would have here, uh, if we look back, the the situation with the Amalekites from Exodus. 17 verses 8 through 16 is we're being told that this battle with Amalek would be tomorrow. It would not be the day that Amalek attacked. Yeah. Okay. So this is in Rephidim. So they leave Rephidim and go to Sinai. But the battle, the battle with Amalek is at Rephidim, and Jethro arrives before they leave. Okay. And how does how does this help with the chronology? Well, they didn't leave Rephidim immediately after the battle with Amalek because that would have meant just just a a direct immediate leaving. I'm just I'm. I'm just looking at this from what I was putting together. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So, but Stephen's argument, I think, is a fairly solid one for it being the fifteenth day of the third month that that they arrive at Sinai and that that covenant is made when they arrive. Would you agree with that? Whichever day it happens to be. The arrival at Sinai, yeah, I'm, I, I would have to look at that on the 15th day because the 15th day of the third month would be on a Sunday that they would arrive. Okay. Stephen, had you looked at that? Um, yeah, sort of. Um, it could be right there. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't. I wouldn't think that would be a problem. You know, I think it's uh, the 18th. I think is a Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so they leave Rafferty and basically, uh, I think uh, on that Sunday and arrive there in the evening, just before sunset. Yeah. So it's not a very long journey. No. And so they just have to, they arrive there and just basically get time to set up their tents and then it's nightfall. Okay. So there's lots of things we don't know. But going back then to um, Exodus 19, uh, we have Israel at Mount Sinai and they're going to, to make this covenant. And then they're going to be... Um, receive the law three days later. So they make a covenant with God before the Ten Commandments are spoken from Mount Sinai. And so this is the situation that's being talked about in Hebrews chapter 12. Right? So when it talks about They've come to a mount. That's the Mount Mount Sinai. That's the giving of the law. All 
Right. We have. Um, I think that's when the trumpet blows. Yeah, when the trumpet trumpet sounds. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's like a summoning. The. Yep. You know, yep. Next. Yeah, because Exodus nineteen thirteen says, "There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned, <coughs> or shot through, whether it be man or beast. It shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, he shall come up to the mount." And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there was thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. So this is coming up to the mount to receive the law. Right? That's what's being talked about. So this is Mount Sinai. So... Any, any other thoughts on that, Dwight, that you want to bring in? Not yet. Okay. Now it says, so you are not come unto the mount that might be, might, might be touched and that burned with fire, right? So we're not coming to Mount Sinai. He says, but ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels and to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, so this firstborn goes back to the inheritance of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So there's this contrast made between the covenant made at Sinai and this covenant here, the, the new covenant, the everlasting covenant. So what's the, what's the contrast that's being presented? Stephen, you have a comment? Yeah, I'm thinking that uh, the one of Sinai is uh, terrifying mm -hmm. to the people. And it's a fear of death. Yes. Right. Where, where we are coming to the city of the living God, and this is about justification. It's about the end of sin. Mount Sinai shows us our sin. But is there hope at Mount Sinai? And if there isn't, why does God have that experience for ancient Israel? There's hope if you do fear God. Okay. That you but, will, that sort of fear can uh, sort of make them desire to, to not sin. I yeah. That was the impression that God was giving them. Yeah. Well, when, what, when Dwight's talking about the fact that they were slaves, they could not understand in their experience what God was calling them to. That is, they were used to being slaves, and God has to address them or appeal to them on that level. Any thoughts on that, Dwight, or anyone else? Well, the point, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the slaves had a certain mindset. They would understand very much that they had been put to work and the work would seem to be endless. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're having to explain to someone that has never seen an airplane or never seen an automobile, how do you place that in terms that they could understand? Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at this, especially in Exodus, 
for this nation that has come away from slavery. Yeah. We need to be able to look at this as how they would have understood it. So what, what I've been looking at and what I've been led to study is God would have given them examples that would have appealed to them and that they would have understood. Okay. Right. Now, now the way that I think at least of an example, um, you know, somebody who's been raised in a terrible household that's been told that they're stupid, that they're worthless, that they're a burden and, and has had all kinds of, you know, arbitrary rules imposed upon them. The natural result is to rebel against that. And, and how do, or, or how do you help a horse that has been beaten and misused? You know, how do, how do you help that horse to understand that it can be cared for? How can it be trained? Now, God is appealing to people in a sense on, on their level, but he's also showing them something different as well. Because one is he has delivered them and done miracles for them. And yet they don't appreciate what God has done. So when they make the covenant with God, all the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. What kind of covenant are they making? Could they have made any other kind of covenant? Could they have just accepted the covenant that was given to Adam and Eve? No, they couldn't because they had that um, pure experience that Adam and Eve had with God. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, so, you know, the question is, why does God do this? Why, why didn't God use some other approach, you know, as, as uh, you know, people who are sitting on the sidelines watching and judging what God did and what he didn't do, humanity often has a criticism uh, with, the, with the scriptures that God didn't know what he was doing. But God is trying to lead them to understand him. But is God a terrible God? Is he a mighty God? Is he somebody to be trifled with? We would, we would have to say that, that God is, in, in his character, something that human beings cannot endure. And God was trying to show that contrast between himself and humanity. God is powerful, but that's not enough to save someone. So he's going to have them go through an experience. And, and Moses demonstrates the cross when he says, you know, blot my name out of the book. But he is leading them step by step from slavery, the slavery of sin, to the liberty that comes with having a Christ-like character. If you have a Christ-like character, are you bound by rules? You're, you're bound by love, not by rules. Right. Love is the working. It's the fulfilling of the law. And if you have a Christ like character, you're not in fear. You're not acting out of fear. But you have to start somewhere in your Christian experience to understand this, because God cannot reveal himself to you when you're a sinner. Not completely. Because men love darkness rather than light. They would rather hide from that light. 
but God gives it to us bit by bit through nature, through our relationships with others, through his word. And as we continue to respond to the light that God gives us, we make a choice. Do we want to have what God has to offer? Or are we going to reject it? And many will reject it, even though it's been offered to them. Eternal life being offered to us is not a great thing if you're not willing to endure the cross. If a life of self-sacrifice is not attractive to you, then eternal life is not attractive to you. So when Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant, what does that mean? What does it mean that speaketh better things than that of Abel? What, what is the contrast there? I think it's some of the same contrast you've been talking about. The difference between, you know, the love motivation or what is your motivation is your motivation just to to do the works of the law or is it you're doing it be out of love yeah and this is not something that we can work up we can't artificially reproduce this like in hebrews eleven four, where it talks about faith by faith abel offered unto god a more excellent sacrifice than cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he dead yet speaketh. So when we look at Abel, and we compare that with what he says, that speaketh better things than that of Abel, what does that mean it speaks better things than that of Abel? Abel was righteous by faith. So how does the new covenant and the blood of sprinkling that Jesus is the mediator of, how does it speak better things than that of Abel? Abel had little examples to work from. Okay. And, and Abel, of, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. And Abel died, didn't he? Yes. But Christ, this new covenant, is the offer of eternal life. Abel, his eternal life, his resurrection from the dead, is dependent upon what Christ has done. That is, even though Abel had faith, his faith doesn't mean anything without, without Christ. That is, all those that died in faith, they're not going to be made perfect without us because we are not made perfect without Christ. Christ's character perfectly reproduced in his people in the final generation is a demonstration of the work of Christ in redeeming humanity. And all those that died in faith are dependent upon that final generation to demonstrate that. Without that final generation of him that is righteous being righteous still, none of them could be saved apart from that final generation. Is this heresy, what I'm stating? stating? Because I'm not saying the final generation is the redeemer of the dead. Because Christ is the Redeemer. But his work has to be completed before he can close up this earth's history. 
because we have more light than all the generations gone before. And so are we surrendering more and more to that light than what previous has, I don't know, are we understanding the consequences more severely? Well, God is bringing humanity through an experience where there are going to be a group of people under the most trying circumstances who are still going to be faithful to God without a mediator. That is, they're going to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator under the most trying circumstances. That's the 144,000. Amen. Now, I, I was just reading uh, through a book on last generation theology. It's actually quite a good little booklet. It's by, um, what's his name? I'm just going to look it up here. Um, Kevin Paulson. And he lays out basically what we all should believe as Seventh-day Adventists that we sadly don't, is that you need this final generation, that it's a promise of God. You need the 144,000 to live a victorious life and that the work of God cannot be completed until that happens. And, and people look at this and they say, well, we're all sinners. We're just going to continue sitting until Jesus comes back. And yet, even when we say that, do we really understand what sin is? Do we really see ourselves as sinners? Mostly we see ourselves as pretty good. It's the other people we see as sinners. So, so the question that, that, that Paul is trying to answer here is how can the, the unjust be made righteous? How can we be made perfect as pertaining to the conscience? That the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, how can he purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You know, he can do this. The old covenant could not do this. So there's something about this new covenant that can do this. And the question is how? And I don't think it's just that man is, is getting smarter or better. That's definitely not the case. Now we say, well, we have more light, but hasn't man rejected light? Aren't we in the darkest time of Earth's history? And yet it's at that point that you're going to see a group of people who are going to be reflecting Christ's character in a way that um, is going to be a witness to the entire universe and that will end sin and this, this world once and for all. So it says in 25, see that ye refuse not him that speaketh. So when Christ speaks, do we want to shut up our ears? No. Yeah. For if they escaped, escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, how much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? So again, he gives this contrast. Christ is speaking to us from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more I will shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, of the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. And what's going to remain? Faith. What, our, our characters, Christ's character, that faith in God, that cannot be shaken. 
So the thing, in order to survive, in order to receive eternal life, we have to hear God's voice and we have to be transformed by it. Because we can't just say we believe in God and that Jesus is just going to come back someday and change our natures and we'll be happy in heaven. Because we won't if that's how it went. Our characters have to be transformed. He says, wherefore, we, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. God could not hide his nature. God acts in accordance with his nature. God, in doing everything that he has done from the beginning of the creation of the world and everything that he will do, is, an, is the result of his nature. And his nature is love. When he came on Mount Sinai, he was demonstrating his nature in a way that the people could understand it. But as individuals, we can't live in that type of fear. We do have to have fear, godly fear, reverence. We have to have a love for who God is. And we have to desire. And in order for that to happen, to desire what God is, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of God in changing us. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You can't just work out your own salvation with fear and trembling if God's not working in you. And we have to work out that which God works in, Al White says. So this cooperation with God, when we look at the covenant, when God gives his promise, he's also illustrating that there's only one way, and that's the way of the cross. That that promise can't be obtained apart from our cooperation with God. It's not our promises, because the new covenant is based upon better promises. The promise is all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient will never create obedience. We have to depend upon the promises of God. We have to trust. We have to have faith that he's going to complete that which he began. This is the work that God's putting before us right now. And he's done it through all this chronology, through all these events, through the experience that we've had externally and internally as a movement, as individuals. And he's bringing us to see his covenant. And we have to allow him to do his work that he promises to do. And this movement is dependent upon understanding this. And there's nothing that anyone can do to make someone else understand it. We can only experience it through the Holy Spirit, through by accepting what God has done and allowing him to work. And any other thoughts on this? So in, in two weeks from now, we're going to do Hebrews chapter 13. And this is going to tell us what kind of people we have to be in how we relate to one another. And we would all agree with it. We can all read Hebrews chapter 13 and agree that we need to act that way. But the question is, do we? So that's that's what I want. You know, that's what we're going to study in two weeks on December 25th. And we have to ask ourselves, how can how can we be changed? How can we have faith in God and trust in him? What is God trying to do?
So any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and for the blessings of fellowship with you. We ask, Lord, that you can show us who we really are. We know that you've given this movement light and understanding. And we have not always heeded that light. We've not reflected your character. And we ask, Lord, that we can. That you can complete the work that you have begun in us. That your work can be completed upon this earth. That the work that Christ has been doing in the heavenly sanctuary will be complete and that he can place the sins upon the head of the scapegoat, that Satan can bear his responsibility. Help us to know, Lord, that you love us and that you are seeking our good. Give us a faith that can endure suffering. And we thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.